Hey guys, welcome to The Bottom Half is Red. I'm your host, Baron Longstrath, and I am excited to bring to you a show that is going to give you some thought-provoking discussions. It's going to give you some expert insights to both encourage and some practical steps for how to build an organization that can more effectively introduce the world to Jesus Christ. So what is the bottom half is red? It's all about building a culture of excellence. It's about growing your unique and creative identity. And it's about carrying out the will of God at any cost. So you're gonna see that through practical teaching tips, developing a culture of giving, creating branding and marketing, or even methods to help guests feel safe and welcomed. This podcast is gonna have you covered. But before we dive into today's episode, I wanna take just a moment and extend a special invitation to all of our dedicated listeners. If you're looking to get even more involved in our community and gain some access to some behind the scenes stuff, become a Patreon supporter. And you can find that link in the episode description or even on Patreon, just visit the bottom half is red. Listen, we can't wait to welcome you on board and to share this exciting journey. Now let's jump into today's episode. Hey, it's good to have you again on The Bottom Half is Red. We have a great episode. It's an exciting episode. It is an episode that we have been looking forward to putting together for some time now. And here's what makes it so exciting, is I'm not doing this alone. I have two co-hosts today. One of them is the lovely Raina Longstreth, which is a vital part of the, of the Bottom Half is Red and the church today. And of course, my personal life. And then we have our executive producer, David Tanderup, joining us. Yes, a round of applause for David Tanderup. <laughs> That's what we get when I control the soundboard. That's exactly right. And you're going to enjoy this, this episode today. Um, it's very important to have him on. In fact, when we were talking about this episode, I said, David, you need to join us. If you could see this setup in my office right now, you would realize why We need him and his perspectives on this topic. The topic today is, organizationally speaking, the difference between targeting excellence over perfection. Yeah. Yeah. That's an important topic. Yeah. But we're going to dive in to make this a practical approach and give some perspectives on the importance of excellence within any organization. Uh, Before we dive into any questions, let's define. Let's start with with a platform in order to be able to launch ourselves from. So the difference between perfection and excellence. Perfection is the condition, the state, the quality of being free or as free as possible from all flaws or defects. That's perfection. Now, excellence is different. Excellence is, by definition, very good of its kind. It's particularly good, or this is what I love the best, it simply means first class. So to start it off, I want both of y'all's opinions on this. Rain, I'm going to start with you. Why is it so vital for a culture to pursue excellence? Why should we try to obtain excellence? And I think you are uh, very qualified to give an excellent definition of that. (laughs) Well, I just think it makes people feel, since I'm wired with all the feelings, I think it makes people feel like that they're important enough for us to strive for the very best that we can give them. And even if you read in the scripture, it talks about being skillful. And I think we should always strive to to be skillful in whatever that we're doing and give the best that we can um, daily. So I just think it's, it's, it's important to make people feel that they matter enough for us to strive for excellence um, in everything that we do. Oh, that's really good. And you're the worship leader of the church today. I am. So take us backstage for a second. We realize that what is cast on a Sunday morning, and we'll just use a Sunday morning as an example, but what is cast on a Sunday morning when we walk in at, let's say, 11 o'clock and we start, the, ch- the church today is, is firing off. It seems like everything is just melting together as one uh, it just didn't arrive there, right? Right. So take us through what a normal Sunday morning would look like as we are striving um, for excellence. 
So a, a, a Sunday morning would start off um, for us would be 5.30 a.m. with the alarm going off with us praying together, obviously in our homes together. We get up at 5.30 a.m. and pray. And then and that's all the that's all the worship team. Yes. And, and the band. Yes. That's a great point. Yes. Um, I also have a band leader and he's getting up at 5.30 and praying as well as everybody. Um, and then we a lot of us get here a little bit before 8.00. And then 8 a.m. starts a uh, sound check for the band. And the vocals are in the music room going over their parts. And so I guess I could even back up for, well, we practice Tuesdays, every other Tuesday, so twice a month, and we get together um, and have a practice. But it's also a lot of alone time, a lot of bench time where we're practicing by ourselves um, throughout the week every day with our vocal parts attached and bench time for the musicians, which is bench time is practicing. So. Mm. Um, that all goes on before we ever get here at 11, um, and then nine 30 is prayer. So we pray again yeah. with the church body. So for a normal Sunday morning, calculate the number of hours of preparation before you get there on a Sunday. Yeah. For a Sunday morning, how long does it take to get where we are on Sunday morning? How long does that take? Goodness. I think for every, probably for every individual, it might be different for the worship leader is probably going to put in more time. The band leader is going to put in more time. Um, uh, Can you calculate that or is that <laughs> impossible to calculate? I, I don't know. Uh, it's an everyday thing. If you're learning a new song, it's going to be a little bit, probably a lot more more hours because you don't know it um, and have to learn it. But the worship leader has to learn everybody's parts, not just their own. And so you have to learn everybody else's parts. Same with the band leader. They have to learn. They need to know wherever the pocket of every musician. So they're going to spend a little bit more time probably than just the musician. Or maybe I do I do have a musician that's that's practicing more than, um, than that. Um, but so we start at five thirty. so whatever that is on Sunday mornings. To- and I love the word daily. Yeah. And I think that that is a word that encompasses exactly what it takes in order to, to be excellent, to give our best. I think the, the word you use skillful, that's the word we want to go for, uh, especially when it comes to uh, worship, but skillful to be skillful. David, your perspective is different. You just recently joined the church today again, yeah. You spent some time overseas uh, in missions, and when we sat down, uh, it wasn't an aimed conversation, I don't think. It was just something that came forth from a conversation. We were meeting about something else. All of a sudden, the bottom half is red. Yeah. And you were intrigued, and as we begin to unfold and unpack this thing, all of a sudden, here we are. And we, this is an amazing setup. It is an, it, if you could see inside of what is going on right now, but this is who you are, and I, I love the fact that who you are is able to to really just kind of merge into the culture. But who you are was not just, it's not just ministry based. Yeah. Okay. So you have a history, a deep, dark history. Oh, good Lord. <laughs> no, you have a history. You, you, and, 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 and he said, hey, please, David did not desire to be on the on podcast today, but his perspective is, what he does is warrants him being on here, but I think his perspective on the way he views excellence. A, a quick background, 13 years in the military, both in the Army as well as the Marines, seven of those years as a helicopter pilot. Yeah. Give us that perspective, whether you want to talk about the difference between perfection and excellence, or if you would like to hit what the expectations were, at least tell us the desire for excellence. So as you mentioned, the, the aviation helicopter world, excellence is just, it's part of like what you have to do. There are standards for everything that you do. I guess a good example would be when I was learning how to fly, hovering is supposed to be one of the easiest things, or it looks the easiest. That's why I should say. Right. Because you're just staying still. You're holding still. You're not doing anything. However, when you first learn how to hover, you're quite literally all over the place, like all over a football field. You could be anywhere inside that football field because there's not a control. You can't meet that standard. Fast forward a few years, and I'm on the controls of a significantly larger helicopter within inches <laughs> of people's inches of people's heads, getting ready to pick up something that can weigh anywhere between 500 and 6,000 pounds. And when you come up off the ground they're going to be standing within feet of what you're picking up. And so you have to have 
precision control to be able to control something that's weighing 22,000 pounds in the air within inches. Mm. And so, yeah, there's absolutely a standard of excellence. I'll probably edit this out, but on top of that, you're busy communicating with between three and five different people at the same time. So you've got a bunch of different conversations because everybody wants to talk to the pilots because that's the greatest thing ever is to talk to the pilots. And I mean, I like talking to myself. So <laughs> and clearly you guys like talking to me because I'm on here. So, but so, so I, I'm, I'm intrigued by uh, a statement you made and you said over the course of a couple of years. Yeah. So describe like what that journey, what that expectation is within the parameters of we'll call it the organization, but the sure. military, a football field to inches in mm -hmm. a few years. What are the road markers? Like, what is that expectation? Absolutely. You've got flight school and the road markers are pretty big. There's not a whole lot of expectation. I mean, it seems like there are when you're there, but then you progress, you leave flight school, you get to your first unit and you come under the care of an instructor pilot. And that instructor pilot is going to start bringing you along and progressing you. Now you do need to know how to fly at the, that point in time. Right. And you need to know how to hold basic standards, but it's through the flying with the instructor pilot where you get qualified to actually go out and fly with what's called the pilot in command. And the pilot in command doesn't have any special certificate other than the fact that he's been entrusted by the unit to be in charge of the aircraft. Right. And so that pilot in command is, that's where all of your learning really, really takes place is with that pilot in command. Right. He's going to teach you like the best ways, the best techniques to do stuff. And you take away stuff from everybody and they're just imparting. It's a constant impartation. They're just leaving little bits with right. you of, Hey, try this technique, try this technique. And so then you develop your own technique of how you do stuff and you start closing the gap. And, and then you reach that point of, Instead of a football field, now it's inches. Mm. And, and, and hence the word first class. Yep. Yeah, hence the word first class. This is a very broad topic. Yeah. So to try to narrow this down in some practical ways for the audience to be able to say, okay, what can I take away from this? Um, we've come up with five reasons. As we look at this, we'll look at perfection, then we'll look at excellence, and let's talk about it. We'll narrow this down and not try to just be limited to church culture, but I think that'll give somebody at least a basis of, of what to say, okay, I, I have something to go off of, if that makes sense. So reason number one, perfection. Perfection will equal a fear of being wrong. Excellence allows for someone to be wrong. David, what, how would you describe that? So when you're practicing flight maneuvers and stuff, if your pilot in command when you're training says, I want you to land this helicopter like an airplane. So you're going to land it on all the wheels and that can be tough. Like that can be scary. And so he'll show you a technique, how to do it. I, I do it like this, you know, I manipulate the controls and you try to do it the first time. You're not going to do it like he does. And excellence is him saying, okay, well, why don't you get on the flight control shadow me on this? And you can see what I'm doing instead of him just packing up and be like, you're a complete failure. I'm going to tell the instructor pilots, you know, you should be barred from flying. You can't hit the maneuver on the first time. It's that willingness to teach. It's, I don't see the ability for grace in perfectionism. Oh, that's, that's a good statement. Yes. That's a really good statement. I was going to add that. Yeah. Well. we'll add something in. Well, <laughs> So perfection, someone that would require for me to be perfect to me, and, and I could be totally wrong, but it's, there's one way to do it and this is how you do it. And that puts me in a box and I don't like to be put in a box because I don't feel like there's just one way to do something. So grace <laughs> would say, you know what? Okay. Okay. I see how you just did that. Might not be the same way that I, I got there, but it's excellent. Yeah. You know, I think to, so perfection this makes me feel very, when I think about being perfect, I th it, it's completely like <sighs> taking the wind out of my wings. Yeah. But excellence, oh, I can do that. Like I can strive for excellence. I have a high expectation that when I, if I were to get on a helicopter, yeah. that that pilot's going to be excellent. Mm -hmm. I have a high expectation if I get, if I'm getting on a plane, that that pilot's going to be excellent. I have a high expectation if I'm going to go into a surgery, <laughs> that the anesthesiologist is going to be excellent. You know, so why would we have any other? 
Oh, yeah. I don't really require for them to be perfect, but I do, you know, they're going to be excellent at their job, yep. you know. And I think looking at it from an organizational standpoint, too, um, last 15 years of pastoring, if you create a culture to where there is no room, there's no room for growth. There's no room to be corrected. There's no room to be wrong. It, it doesn't invite people to come on as a volunteer. Yeah. They may attend because things are done so well, but part of the journey is getting people involved. And so if they are so afraid of doing something wrong versus the willingness to be able to say, oh, yeah, absolutely, I can do it that way. Um, and I could do it to the best of my ability this way. And like you said, I don't have to do it exactly your way, but I'm able to do that. What about this? Perfection controls people in the process, right? And then excellence grows people in the process, which is why we want to strive for excellence because there is growth versus perfection, which is ultimately about control. Yeah. You, there is one way to establish that. This is the only way. Um, Raina, you are the worship leader for the church today, but you have multiple uh, worship leaders that are underneath you. The three of you that are in operation now and four that are, we're adding another one, not a single one of them does it exactly like you. Right. So, but what you're trying to do is ultimately say, this is the standard, right? And um, we're, like David said, we're trying to shadow in order to reach a goal, but you allow them. Is that right? How do you allow them to be themselves as a worship leader? I don't say anything to them. I'm not trying to create little reinas around here. I just want them to be, I want them to lead worship with excellence and be the, the best that they can be. But they know us, they know there's a standard. There is a standard. Yeah. And that's been communicated. It's been communicated. Yeah. There's times that I might see see something that I'm like, oh, I could help him with that, and then yeah. in just little ways have a conversation. Say, hey, yeah, you know, did you feel that when the Lord came in like that, or the Spirit was moving this way, and just insert little this. This is what you know you could do, or yeah. this is how you could flow, and this is what it feels like, and um, or whatever um, instruction. We operate at the church today somewhere around that 200 marker, okay, and that's you know plus or minus whatever the holiday is. We have nearly 120 of those members that are faithful on our volunteer teams. So nearly 60% of our congregation is actively doing something on a weekly basis. It's a lot of people. Yeah. But the reason why, and in recent years, our volunteer growth has been enormous. Like we'll, we'll jump 15 in one year. 16 in one year. I think a lot of that is because we have created a culture that produces people to be able to be confident as a, a leader or volunteer, which is one of our next points, is perfection creates this unnecessary frustration that perhaps I can never be good enough, right? So why would I want to join something if I can never be good enough? Mm -hmm. If we make the mistake of producing unnecessary frustrations because of expectations that will rarely be met, we're doing ourselves a disservice as opposed to creating a culture that celebrates when a particular leader or that team or ministry arrives or reaches its goal, whether it's an event yeah. or whether it's in production as a ministry. How does celebration produce confidence? I think being a fan of somebody, it gives them, even if it's not the greatest thing that could have taken place, you celebrate the milestone, the victory. Hey, man, like you crushed that landing or you know what? You did a really, really good job. It's been better than all of the other ones. You know, it's it's getting smoother. I barely spilled my coffee. Hmm. Just, you know, or... I think it's those small things that we celebrate, particularly in public. Yes. If, if you celebrate somebody in public and pull them aside and correct them or instruct them in private, it gives them that sense of, you know what, they've got my back. Yeah, I love that. I love that, David. That's, that's so good. We, we have to rush through here because we can't take all the time in the entire world. We want to because this is such a fantastic conversation 
Let's look at the fourth one and let's expound on the fifth one and close out right there, okay? So the fourth one would be that perfection produces an attitude of never being satisfied. And sometimes we're not really just talking about from the individual. We're talking about from perhaps the leader to an individual. They feel like they're never satisfied with the work. They're always tweaking something. They're always changing something. There's always an address. And preference is included. Like leaders have the the right for preference, okay? But if what you said and what Ray said earlier, if we as leaders press down on somebody so hard to not give them the opportunity to use that God created, right, talent, every good gift comes from above, right? So, and we're not allowing them to express what God gave them. We're not, we're not creating a, an opportunity for them to be able to be celebrated for what God does to or through them. So it, it's, it's that, but excellence does something different. Excellence always looks for the opportunities. And I love that. It's, it's, yeah, you know, why don't we do this a little better? Why don't we try this? And, and that's the difference between the two there, but here's the fifth one. And, the, and let's close it out right here. And I want your guys' opinion on this, but for perfection, perfection prefers safety and avoid creative risks versus excellence, which examines the possibilities and will even embrace what we'll call some uncertainties. Excellence is not afraid. Perfection avoids those creative elements. Somebody expound on that for me. To me, it's just this, the square box that you have to stay in too. So if, if you are going to try to be perfect at all times, there is that really to me smothers out the creativity part because you don't know if it's going to be accepted. And I, you said this earlier about um, we have a we have a core value in our worship team is we praise publicly and we correct silently. And when you do that, it allows the individual to grow, to be creative because everybody loves a pat on the back, the attaboy. And I don't care how old you get, it's so nice to, you know, I don't require every time I step off the platform someone to say, man, great job today or because I'm, I find my validation in Jesus Christ, my relationship with him. But it is nice to have that. It feels hey, good. It feels good. I mean, you, I don't think you ever get to the age where you don't need that. It's like all the time that you put into something, it's so nice when someone's, you know, we do that to celebrate one another. It also helps them to grow that the time that they're putting in behind the scenes, mm. that, it's, that, you're, that you see it. The private stuff that you're doing privately to, to be excellent and to grow, when someone gives you that attaboy or they notice it, it's like it, it empowers you to keep being excellent. It empowers you to keep spending those hours in prayer. It empowers you to keep uh, practicing, to keep studying. It's just that it's just that that fresh air that you need that it's like, oh, people see that I'm growing. People see that I'm striving to be excellent. And um, I love that about it. Yeah. I think that excellence understands the process and the mechanics better. So in order to have creativity, I think that you have to understand or have a little bit better of a concept of the way that things work instead of perfectionism, because perfectionism puts you in that box. And it says, I'm going to do the same way every single time I've got the cookie cutter mold. And you don't actually understand the way that the thing works cooking. If this doesn't go quite right, I can take and I can add this in here. Is it part of the recipe? No, it's not. But I know that it's going to produce the result that I want because I have that creativity. I understand excellence and I'm not confined to this box. Right. When we first planted the church almost 16 years ago, I remember filling that box of the perfection of a pastor's wife because I'd never been a pastor's wife before. And I remember just almost crumbling at the thought that I wasn't like so-and-so, wasn't like so-and-so. I thought differently. I seen things differently. I seen the world different. I seen the, even the scriptures in the Bible, they would communicate to me differently. And I remember just kind of just almost wanting to crumble underneath that pressure of that. And one of the things that one of my mentors said to me, Janice Showstrand was like, Raina, do your best. And it's, that's good enough. And she said that to me so many times over the years. And if I know that I'm doing my best and it's the most excellent that I can be, then I know that it's good enough. And it has helped me to, to remain, to strive to be excellent. Here's what, here's what Michael J. Fox said. I am careful not to confuse excellence with perfection. Excellence I can reach for. Perfection is God's business. Let's be first class.
Thank you so much for joining us on The Bottom Half is Red. Uh, Listen, I hope you have enjoyed your time with us today and gained something of value. If you love what you heard today, please do not forget to subscribe to our podcast and leave us a review on your favorite podcast platform. This helps us. Your feedback is incredibly crucial and we want to improve on what we're doing and to bring you the best content possible. You can find us on Facebook, look us up, Instagram, even YouTube at the bottom half is red. Hey, be sure to check the episode description for any links to any resources that we have mentioned during the show. You don't want to miss out. This podcast is a production of The Church Today here in the great city of Tulsa, and the executive producer is our very own David Tandra. I hope you've had a fantastic time, and we look forward to having you with us again on our next episode of The Bottom Half is Red. We'll see you then.